to think is devastating. Where giving up means at worst to die slowly outside of the spotlight of what we call the international community. It is in this context where every act matters. In the face of this objection, these challenges do not produce any easy victories. But that doesn't mean that there are no victories. And that these victories need to be cherished, they need to be celebrated and supported. And there are many in this room that do support some of them. When people choose to hope when there is little hope, when people choose to sing when there is little to sing about, and when people, to ch when people choose to fight for a peace only because they have learned that it is better than war, then it must be celebrated. Initially, I found that this celebratory dance and feeling was not so easy, and that celebrating life in the context of so much hardship is really hard work, but I found it to become easier with time and practice, and over time, this practice in itself becomes important and needs to be celebrated. I want to start towards concluding. The reclaiming of spirit, of hope, and of dignity is what drives us still today on the streets of Cape Town. Not the fact that we believe that everybody died for nothing. The time of the everyday, the time of development, I would argue has a different temporality to the time of mourning, to the time of self-reclamation, and to the time of recovery. Especially that recovery if it's from a continuous war on spirit, and on peoplehood. The challenge of slowing down and making sense of what this new moment of peace means must neither be taken for granted nor lost to the socioeconomic sliding towards another violent fracture. Claiming back hope, giving time to reclaim back time from the objective zones of pessimism and fracture to co-create collective spaces for the practices of recovery and peace is also in my context right now to resist this machine that we call development. So I would argue that peace must always include a plan to repair the lives and communities of those who were destroyed, that it needs time and it needs money and it should be invested into the areas where apartheid caused most of its damage to the souls of the destroyed as much as the buildings. Our war against humanity during that time was every day and all the time on the bus, on the pavement, in the street, at the threshold of that coffee shop that you speak of. So for us today, peace action specifically entails the rebuilding of lives, the opening up and the insertion of spaces for mourning and the reclamation of the self as a political economy.
against the political economy of globalization and the constant pressure to rush on and quickly and make as if nothing happened. For me, you've asked what does peace mean? The peace that I feel will endure should not dissipate into the mirage beyond this present time of pausing and breathing. The memory and celebration of resistance resides precisely in acknowledging the possibility of reflecting this in time. How else will the hope for a time of peace that was carried so fervently at the height of resistance against the apartheid be sustained into the present and its tomorrows. For me, peace is more than a creation of a lager of secured, exclusive spaces of residence, economic opportunity, consumerism, and leisure in which previous colonial and apartheid beneficiary classes, as well as a few others, I have to admit, are able to enjoy the fruits of so much pain and sorrow. It is in the interest of sustaining peace as well as in the interest of the beneficiaries of these previous systems of oppression and atrocity that we all act, including them, responsibly. If the history of their making is to avoid an ineluctable, an ineluctable, ineluctable, I struggle with this big word sometimes, an ineluctable repetition so that an active working through of the damage that we have lived is possible. That the active working through of damage that people live is possible. Whether it's on the streets of Cape Town or on the south side of Chicago, or it's in the memory of Wounded Knee Creek. For me, it is easier to clutch at sharp, it is easier to clutch at sharp thorns on offer when the rose bush presents itself than it is to smell the roses and imagine the thorns away. We do this easily, quickly. We imagine that there are no thorns and that there are only sweet smells. But when you've come back from objection, it's not possible, even if you want to. And sometimes, believe me, I want to. Sustainable peace in a country that has known only war is only possible when that country is able to come to terms with itself, to face itself in all the splendor that comes with its horror. The so South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission gave us the opportunity to begin this process. Now we have to take it up and live it. Since I've been here, there's been much talk of forgiveness in this word. Forgiveness, if such a thing, is at all politically possible beyond the understanding of just me and you, I feel must grow socially out of a full remembering, not out of a selective process of amnesia. If out of bitterness we are to be able to der derive the necessary understanding and wisdom and strength to put the world to live in peace and at peace, then that world should 
and I argue can be far stronger than the world that might give expression to other emotions of anger and bitterness and hatred and revenge. The Commission. Whether on, in South Africa, Argentina, or Guatemala, When the words never again were the words nunca mas or the words ni vida exist, they must be more than just words, just glib words to justify plasters pasted over festering wounds. Never again must mean that the violence of war must stop. And not just for those who benefit from the peace, but for everyone. And if we do not act with intention to do that, then let us not use those words, which is more honest. Those of us who have to recover people from objection, it's easy to explain that to them. Let us not use these words if we do not mean to actively ensure them extended to every distended stomach, crying, demanding to be at peace. It is more honest. Let us not use those words. Now, it is this globalization of humanity that I dream of and support, where I don't have to switch on the television and see just another killing and just, not, just another bomb and just another soldier thinking that killing is okay. In this remote controlled second where life, my life, lives itself over and over again. It is here that sits my and our responsibility as people, as human beings, outside of color and outside of religion. Regardless of passports, and regardless of privilege, to make peace longer and more real than just another national, just another global moment. In my country, we continue 12 years after the war. We continue in this quest, in this oftentimes quickly forsaken ideal and belief that, huma that humanity will and has to find an alternative to resolving itself through war. And I know that there are many here who share with me in this dream. I can see it in your smiles and in your eyes and in the seriousness of the silence. So despite my own personal experience, I have to fight with myself to remember always that butterflies have color and that they will always be beautiful, regardless of what we as human beings do to each other. And by saying so, by saying so that my own life will have meaning beyond the confines of my skin and my world, and that I will continue in the belief that I will be able to laugh with as much intensity as I am able to cry and that it is just that okay. Now I've chosen to stay in the metaphor. The facts we can discover in libraries and books if we are drawn to them.
I want to end my talk this evening, my discussion, my plea. I thought about the fact that I needed to do it on a light note so that I don't leave here with a whole auditorium thinking that I'm just that intense. <laughs> but I fail, I'm sorry. So, like I began this discussion that I hope will continue, I want to end in dedication to the forgotten soldier. In this case, he was a young man with a little frame and could just as easily have been me. So I will read you a poem. I'm not sure whether it's in keeping with academic style, but because this is the first one, hopefully there is no repeating. So I will do it. Um, this poem is called Kidogo, the spelling of which is irrelevant, but it means little. I realize now why I've been doing all of this, you know, was to keep with a mic, so it's your fault. <laughs> okay, if I, was, if I had that thing, yeah, I could have been walking and I wouldn't have to bounce up and down and try to get this angle right and keep all of you here without <laughs> leaving me alone talking to myself. <laughs> Kidogo. Too tiny, too tiny whose flesh heaped I remember. Too tiny whose flesh heaped I remember across a mounted machine gun, lifeless. Too tiny. Nevertheless, we barked, nevertheless, we barked. <sighs> we chanted freedom, young boys, 16 year olds. We chanted freedom, young boys, 16 year olds with guns, 16 year olds with hopes of sanity. Too tiny, too tiny, my tears. To you, my dreams. To tiny, my childhood, whose face shattered, bleeding bullet holes, whose face shattered, bleeding bullet holes, and whose silent scream etches itself onto paintings at night. Bleeding, bleeding bullet holes, gaping holes gaping through humankind to tiny my brother and to those worms who caressed your corpse when you displaced those who slept in graves that could bear no more. I remember your belt intact with my fingers sweating, sweating with the tears my eyes refused. I remember your belt intact. When I did not acknowledge the bones we broke so that we could bury you, we gritted our teeth and we held our stomachs, real teeth and real hair. We stood up straight and we looked into the heavens and we imagined what it would be like to be just good soldiers. I remember your belt intact as it left my waist my brother, my brother, I remember you smiling, so tiny.
Now they call us kidogos with no politics. But that is only in the 90s. In the 80s, we scooped out skulls with the politics. I remember you, my brother. And I hope that others will remember you too. Smiling, just that, just that, just that, smiling. hope that it's in the tension of silences like these that we will be able to ref find those moments and reflect. Not only the answers, but also the means and the mechanisms that allow us to extend our humanity to each other. I imagined what a blank page looks like with only a full stop. And what the challenge looks like to fill it with all of us, side by side and hand in hand, from Cape Town to Seattle, and from Seattle to Beijing. I hope that 